Talk with Brad Keithley, who's a former oil and gas counsel and consultant. He is also founder and managing director of the organization Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We talk with him about the various things that are going on inside the state. Today is no different. He joins us to discuss uh, uh, to discuss it. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? Good, good, sir. Good. It's not Monday. That's I'm, I'm all happy about that. <laughs> um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the state of oil, gas, politics, and more. Let's start off with uh, uh, let's start off with this piece in the uh, Fairbanks Daily News Miner from Frank Murkowski, who seems to be a little late to the party. And uh, I got to start asking questions like, uh, like, is is he asleep? Did, I mean, did he miss something? All of a sudden, he's back to talking about the uh, he's back to talking about the uh, oil uh, the oil tax credits again. All of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, just seems like he's completely out of touch with what's going on in the state. Well, it's either it's either he's late to the party or he's early to the next party. Uh, frankly, the way I read. Uh, that piece was that it's that the the those who want to make the early payments on the oil and gas tax credit obligations uh, are starting up again. Uh, they're starting in advance of next session, uh, and and I sort of read Murkowski's piece as a kickoff uh, uh, to that effort. Uh, a, a new direction. They're trying. They're trying a new approach this time. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I, I think Frank. I, I, I read the piece as Frank uh, as being the uh, sort of the leading edge of of trying that new approach. So, so, uh, so, uh, a snapshot is here for us then, because I mean, what I was reading into this is that he's basically going back to the tried and true is that we're not upholding our obligation, which uh, I think is incorrect based on my reading of the law and what they were supposed to do. We paid what we were supposed to pay. It would have been. It would have been. It's the nice to haves versus the must haves we paid the must have he's talking about paying the nice to haves and if we don't then we're somehow welshing on our deal yeah here let's set the stage uh, for just a second there is a statute that governs the oil and gas tax credits that statute provides that each year the state is supposed to put into a fund to pay the credits a certain amount of the proceeds from production taxes when production taxes are high the amount that goes into the fund and the amount that is available for payment to the producers is high. When when uh, production tax revenues are low, as they have been since 2014, the amount that goes into the fund is low, uh, and the amount paid to producers is is low. But it's tied to what the state's revenue stream is, um, and is and that's always been the case all the way back to 2007 when the when the program was first uh, established. Uh, what what the producers have argued, what some have argued in the last couple of years is, is yeah yeah we know that's what the statute is, but we want paid we want paid all of our obligation all of the all of the payments that the state's going to owe us at one time or another. We want it we we want it all now. We want the payment up front, um, and that's not what the statute provides. The statute provides there will be a certain amount put into the fund each year, uh, tied to production tax credits or tied to production tax revenues. And if they're if the state wants to pay more, they can, but that's not that's not what the statute obligation obligates them to do. Just for a moment, compare that to the to the to the permanent fund distri- uh, dividend statute that says the state shall put fifty percent of the earning stream uh, calculated in accordance with the statute into the permanent fund dividend uh, each year. So here's what happened uh, to the to in the legislature last year. They paid what the statute obligated them to. Uh, under under the old oil gas tax credit cr- program, they didn't pay. They violated the statute, defaulted under the statute with respect to the permanent fund dividends. Now, what Murkowski is arguing is we ought to go to some extraordinary efforts in a new way, and we'll talk about that in a second. But in a new way, uh, go to these extra- extraordinary efforts to pay all of the oil gas tax credits now, up front, in advance of what the statute requires. Um, and and Murkowski doesn't even talk about the other statutory obligation, uh, <laughs> uh, the permanent fund dividend that, that we defaulted on last right. year. So it, it it's a I mean, it clearly it's 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 an article or, or it's a it's a piece that that is trying to get the state to do something it's not statutorily obligated to do at the same time that the legislature didn't do what it's statutorily obligated to do in another area. Well, but I guess what struck me in that regards is that it is, I mean, blatantly misleading. 
saying that we are welshing and that we're reneging on our deal. I mean, he, he's yeah. almost he almost comes out and blatantly says we're violating the law. He doesn't say that out, but the implication is is that by not doing this, we're violating the law. In, in but in, well, in in fact, we're not. Yeah, he says we're breaching a contract, and the right, contract. Right. Uh, it, uh, and and the contract is what the statute provides. I mean, the the the, the state had no further ability to contract than what what's provided in the statute. The statute provided that we would pay in the fashion I just described, and and that's what the contract provides. So yes, he's absolutely wrong when he says we're breaching a contract. The contract said we would we would have an obligation to fund the credits from uh, production tax revenues. We've done that. We've done that every consistently every year. Some years we paid more, and the producer said, well, we have an expectation that you would always pay more. Uh, but that's not what the contract provides. That's not a contractual provision. The contract provides that we would fund from from production tax revenues, and, and that's what we've done. So, yes, to that extent, he's absolutely wrong. The premise of the uh, premise of the piece is absolutely wrong from that, from that standpoint. Right, which, again, leads me just to ask the question – what what's the what's the back play here? And you're saying that uh, I mean I'm saying he was late to the party. You're saying no no no. We're getting a sneak peek at what could be coming up in the next session or the next set of discussions. Right. So here here is the twist in in Murkowski's piece that's somewhat new. Uh, in the last sessions, uh, we've the legislature has debated taking money essentially out of savings. Um, and and paying the producers in advance, there were proposals to to move uh, 600 million, 400 million dollars um, uh, out of uh, out of one account and and put it into uh, the fund and pay the producers um, in advance. So the proposals, previous proposal, have been to do it out of savings. Murkowski's proposal, and this is why I think it's a forerunner of of another effort. Murkowski's proposal is to is to set that approach aside and instead use the state's bonding power, the state's debt power, uh, to, to borrow money to pay the producers. Right. Uh, what, he's, what he's proposing is that we use either ADA, uh, the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, um, uh, use their bonding power or use the railroad's bonding power to go out and borrow money on the open market and then pay that money over to the producers and satisfy what Murkowski says are the contractual obligations aren't really, but satisfy what what Murkowski says are the contractual obligations of the producers, and then the state to pay off uh, that debt going forward. What the, from an economic standpoint, what that essentially does is transfer the risk of of the time value of money from the producers who are obligated to accept that under the statute and agreed to accept that risk. Uh, at the time they entered into the program, because they knew the statute provide, provided for the payment schedule that, that's in the statute tied to production tax revenues, transfer that risk of the time value of money from the producers over to the state and obligate the state to go out and use its credit uh, to borrow the money to pay the producers uh, and, to, and, to, and then for the state to bear, bear the interest costs and for the state to, uh, to do the payback. So that if the, if the payback stretches over – a number of years, five years, ten years, right. then it's the state who's paying the interest on that money uh, during that payback period uh, as opposed to the producers paying uh, paying their bankers or their lenders uh, the interest on that money uh, over the payback period. So it's it's a blatant attempt to – frankly, it's a blatant attempt to, 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 to transfer one of the risks the producers accepted going into the program from the producers. Now that that risk has come to fruition, transfer that risk from the producers – um, over to the state. Bad idea for a, a lot of reasons. One, the state shouldn't be accepting the risk that it doesn't. It never. It never took before. Shouldn't be volunteering for that risk, particularly in the middle of a fiscal crisis. Um, and two, uh, it, it the state you know is going to need may need its credit capacity going forward. We shouldn't be using it up. Uh, and shouldn't be, you know, <laughs> drawing down our lines of credit right. to, to pay produce to pay producers early. So right. it's it, it it's a bad idea, but uh, it's you know it is former Governor Murkowski, um, and I think it's I think it's an effort to, to to try to end run the problems that uh, that 
that uh, those who want who want advanced payment of these uh, of these uh, payments uh, have run into by trying to get direct funding from the legislature. I think they're trying another run, another way at it. Which <clears throat> is a little troubling because, again, I think it shows that, uh, you know, Murkowski is a Republican. He's part of the Republican establishment in the state. And it shows that they are not really serious about putting government in the size and growth category of sustainability. Instead, they're looking to pay back those who, uh, you know, the business as usual crowd, the business movers and shakers, as we were talking with the revenue commissioner last week or, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the 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 business leaders in the state. And that that may not necessarily have the interests of the citizens themselves at heart. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. This this proposal clearly a buyout of a special interest clearly is a buyout of interest. You look at the statute, and the statute clearly says the only the state's fiscal obligation is to make payments uh, from production tax revenues. They go up, they go down, but they're tied to production tax revenues. Always been the case since 2007 when the program was started. That's always been the case, and and clearly Murkowski's trying to end run that, uh, and others have tried to end run that in various ways. Uh, to, to, to shuffle money, sh- uh, uh, shovel money over to uh, that particular set of, of uh, business interests uh, early uh, and, and, and give them money in a way that they don't have to go out and borrow it or they don't have to go out and deal with investors. The state just gives it to them. And that's, and that's clearly not in the interest of Alaskans, particularly in this, at the same time that the legislature has violated the statutory obligation on the amounts to transfer to the to the permanent fund dividend, particularly at a time when they've taken money out of the pockets of individual Alaska families uh, through through the the non statutory PFD cuts. So it's it's you know it's clearly not in the best interest of of Alaskans, but that's not stopping them. Uh, it it, it they they they're trying this 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 next end run. Uh, and trying to get that funded. So I guess my bigger question at this point is then uh, if if this is if this is the and I, and I guess I got to go back for a second and rewind for a second because he again he talks about breaching of contract. Is do you think he's trying to say that the contract that he's referring to is that brochure and pamphlet that that we saw Kara Moriarty and other people say? Well, they said they in the pamphlet they said they'd do it. They said that they'd pay these, you know, that this, this is the expectation that we based everything off this pamphlet, not off the actual statute itself. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I don't know what he's trying. See, that that argument that it was all in the pamphlet got debunked in the carbon piece that finally focused on uh, the arguments that, right. that, that, that the producers were making. And, and, you know, Alex went through the pamphlet and said, well, there's a reference to the statute. And the statute says this. Right. Um, so right. I. I mean, Frank doesn't. Frank's piece doesn't try to identify now where this contract's coming from. It's just sort of these, this amorphous contract. Basically, what he's trying to argue is we had a program. We have a program. The program says that that producers will get will get paid these credits uh, at 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 some point, and and so that's a contract. And 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 now now we, we need to pay them. We pay that we need to pay them this debt. Well, you know, that's the same thing to try to bring it down to, to, to an individual's standpoint. That's the same thing as saying I've got a 20 year mortgage on my house. Um, and and so I own uh, I owe the lending company over 20 years X amount. And it's the same thing as, as saying, well, you owe the, the mortgage company you know X amount over 20 years. Pay it all now. Right. Uh, that's not my obligation. My yeah. obligation is to pay it off monthly. Right. And that's the state's obligation under the production tax credit program. Murkowski is essentially saying, well, you have a contractual obligation to pay it, to pay that entire mortgage amount. So let's just pay it now. Right. And let's and I, te- and I tell you what, instead of instead of you having you having to pay it, let's just get the state to pay it <laughs> for you uh, in advance. So it's, right. it's not a it, it, it's a. Uh, it, 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 it's not a it's not a well founded argument, but I do, Michael. I, I personally, I think this is the forerunner of the next effort uh, of of those producers to try to get advanced funding on on what they claim uh, what they claim they're owed. Well, and it's an interesting snapshot 
uh, because I think it shows in part, uh, again, Murkowski, you can't ignore the fact that Murkowski is a Republican wheel. I mean, he's a he's he's a he's a luminary in the Republican Party of the state of Alaska. And it shows us a troubling trend. It shows us, one, that this could be where the narrative is moving forward, that we're again bailing out or or helping out big industries versus uh, the citizens. And couple that with the fact that the legislature and specifically the Senate Republicans who have uh, stood vehemently against uh, any kind of income tax, but who are wholeheartedly and happily endorsing a tax on every Alaskan through the the dividend and a further fundamental changing of the dividend program going forward, how problematic that is for the citizens of the state. It, it is. And it's all, I mean, if you look at this, if you step back and look at what's going on, it's all t- tilted toward the top 20%, right? It's all tilted toward the toward the business interests in the top 20%. The permanent fund dividend barely, barely nicks the top 20%, or the cut in the permanent fund dividend barely nicks the top 20%, less than 2% for a family of four in the in the top 20 percent but more than 30 percent of with it takes more than 30 percent of the income of a family of four in the bottom 20 percent uh 15 uh, percent in in the next 20 percent even even the upper middle income bracket uh the the 20 percent after the top 20 percent it takes five percent takes more than double uh from that income bracket than it takes from the top 20 percent so the, the, the Senate Republicans are going down the road of protecting the top 20 percent through through the PFD cut. And now they're through in, in Murkowski's proposal. If they go down that road, they would be bailing out special interests, special business interests uh, ahead of Alaskans, because, again, we've cut the statutory. We've cut the statutory PFD at the same time that Murkowski's arguing we got to go. We should go forward and advance pay uh, on these oil and gas tax credits. Very, you're right. Very troubling trend. Uh, among the uh, um, among the Republican establishment. Brad Keithley is our guest. We're talking oil, gas, politics, and more. It's right here on your own for Common Sense Radio, the Michael Duke Show. Second part of the segment now going into it. We were just talking about Frank Burkowski's opinion piece on the oil and gas credit program, the oil credits, and how uh, we're concerned that it could be a precursor for the next round of discussions coming up this next regular session uh but we've got brad joining us right now and and as i was saying to the the last session we saw that the republicans uh have decided in their infinite wisdom that it's okay to tax all alaskans they're against an income tax they're against a payroll tax they're against all these other taxes but they're they're a-okay with taxing alaskans at the dividend level no problem in fact permanently changing that which basically leads us on to our next discussion, which is if they are going to tax us, there's really only one fair and equitable, uh, equitable way to do it, and that is to leave the permanent fund alone and fund it to the statutory limit that Brad was talking about earlier that they're ignoring right now and basically institute um, a flat tax. Let's talk a little bit about that, Brad. Well, yeah, the setup again, and it's not all Republicans. We need to be. We need to be no, clear no, about no. This. It's so, majority. The, yeah. yeah, right, right. Not not to tar everybody with with the same brush. But last session, uh, the Senate the Senate Republicans who had promised in the 2012, 2014, and 26 uh, election campaigns that they were the ones elect them. They were going to reduce costs. They could get costs spending under control uh, and and avoid the need for new revenue sources. Uh, the last session, the Senate Republicans turned around and voted 12 to 2 uh, to cut the PFD uh, rather than uh, cut spending further. In other words, they said, you know, we, we've reached the limits of how, of how far we effectively are going to be able to cut spending. We need new revenues. We're going to cut the PFD by 50 percent, impose a 50 percent tax on the PFD, uh, essentially to to fund government. Not only did they do that last session in in the 2016 session, They'd voted. They they passed a bill permanently to do that. It got stopped in the House through the efforts of Lynn Gaddis, Tammy Wilson, and others. Uh, but then they voted again for it uh, uh, last session to permanently cut the PFD. So th- this is not when you and I talk about new revenues. We didn't start this. This is not a situation where we're going out and saying government needs more money. It's not us that's done that. It's the Senate Republicans and the House and the governor. That have decided that that the state needs more money. They need to they need to take money out of the pockets of individual Alaskans, which the PFD cut does, 
uh, and put it in the hands of government. They need to. They need to. The, the, the government needs to be spending this money instead of individual Alaskans. It's not you and me that's, that, that's decided that's the right thing to do. It's the Senate. So once we're going down that road, the question then becomes: What's the how? If you're going to raise new revenues, what's the right way to do it? Right. The problem. The problem with the PFD cut is that according to ICER's analysis, Institute of Social and Economic Research, the best economic think tank in the state, according to an, an analysis that ICER did last year, cutting the PFD has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy of all of the new revenue options. It, it cuts, it reduces jobs more, it reduces overall income more than any other option, any other new revenue option. Uh, it has the largest adverse effect on families by far, uh, to use ICER's term, the worst effect on families of all of the new revenue options. It shoves 12 to 15,000 Alaskans, 2% of the population, below the poverty line that would otherwise be a poverty line. And it has a hugely disproportionate effect on Alaska families. As we were talking about the last segment, it cuts less than 2% of the income of the top 20%, cuts more than 30% of the income of the, of the bottom 30%. Hugely disproportionate effect on, on, on Alaska families. So the PFD is, of all of the levers, if you were, if you were just looking at the econ economic effects of all of these levers, cutting the PFD is the absolute worst thing you can do of, of all of those options. There are better options. Um, <laughs> Badly enough, I mean, to show you how bad cutting the PFD is, a progressive income tax uh, uh, has a better effect on the overall economy, a less less worse effect on the overall economy than a PFD cut. It has a less worse effect on Alaska families. But again, than you're, a PFD you're cut. but you're not again. We're not advocating that. We're just pointing nope. out nope. Uh, again. We're nope. pointing out how bad each one of these is for the economy. You're right. Exactly. Exactly right. How bad the PFD cut is for the economy. The best, if you if you look at it from an economic standpoint, and you look at it from a fairness standpoint, and you look at it from the effect on on the Alaska families, the best is a flat tax. Flat tax. Taking the total uh, adjusted gross income of Alaska, which is about twenty seven billion dollars, by the time you gross it up for the for the Alaska income earned by non residents, which would also be covered by the tax. Uh, uh, it, to raise about the same amount as the Senate's trying to raise through PFD cuts, a flat tax would be about 2.75%. So every Alaskan would pay about 2.75% instead of this proportionate effect uh, that the PFD cut uh, or other options have. It, that that would have that would have the broadest effect. It would spread the base the broadest. It would result in the lowest uh, net tax on everybody. Uh, and it would tax the richest Alaskans and the poorest Alaskans at the same rate, 2.75% uh, of your income. That also, the piece I, uh, a piece I wrote uh, this week uh, adds an additional uh, perspective on that. I think that approach also does the best in controlling government spending. The problem with the PFD cut is that the top 20% doesn't really feel it. So they're not motivated they're not involved in trying to control in, in trying to control spending right this effort i think uh, this effort to, to fund the oil and gas tax credits early is a good example of that that's something that benefits uh, uh several of those um, a lot of those in the top 20 percent they are pursuing that because they really don't feel the pain of it under a pfd cut most of the burden is shifted to middle and lower income Alaskans to, to pay for that program. So the top twenty percent is pursuing it because they don't really feel they don't really feel the impact. Well, and what you, happens? You comment on this. Yeah. You talk specifically in this piece about how you know that th that there are those in the Senate and those that are supporting them and are defending this approach they're taking because they say it is the best way to control spending, which is just it's laughable. Now, again, the only way to control spending is to give us more revenue. That's how you control spending. That's essentially the argument, which is, I yep. mean, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but that's essentially the argument, which how you could say that with a straight face is, is it's laughable. Well, and, and the, Senate, the Senate says cutting the PFD control spending because it, 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 cutting the PFD doesn't, produ doesn't, doesn't uh, produce enough revenue to close the entire fiscal gap. So they're saying cutting the PFD funds part of the fiscal gap, the part we need to fund, uh, but it leaves this, quote, structural deficit, and that provides us with an incentive, says the Senate, 
provides us with an incentive to go cut spending further. Well, that's just that's just silly. The the Senate Republicans took power in the Senate. I mean, they took they they they, they reasserted control in the Senate in the elections of 2012. They took power back from the Senate bipartisan majority, which itself was a problem. The Senate Republicans came back and said in the 2012 elections, elect us. We're going to control spending. We're going to get government back under control. We're going to put you know Humpty Dumpty back together again, and we'll be fine. The, the, amazingly, in every fiscal year since the Senate Republicans took control again, we've had deficits. Revenue hasn't covered spending. Um, it, it, it's been both a structural deficit in the sense that they haven't that they that they that they've spent above the long-term sustainable spending level, but they've also spent above revenues. They've also run a cash deficit every year since they took power again in 2012. So if a structural deficit, and that's what that's what a structural deficit is, right? You have you, your your revenues don't equal your projected revenues don't equal your spending. If a structural deficit was going to bring fiscal was going to bring you know this discipline in 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 line to to control spending, it would have happened by now. It would have happened. I mean, they've run these they've run these deficits now for five years. We would have had spending under control if the, if a quote structural deficit was a sufficient incentive to bring it back under back under control. So the argument that uh, give us give us your PD, PFD and then we'll control spending because we'll still have this deficit out there and we'll do things that will get spending that will cut spending and get it back under control. They haven't done it in five years. Right. Gosh, only knows why the heck any anybody would think they're gonna they're gonna do it in the future. After those five years, after those five years of structural deficits that they run, what did they do? They raised revenue. Right? They cut the PFD. They raised new revenue. They didn't get spending under control. They raised new revenue. So if you if you continue to buy into this theory that running a structural deficit will get things under control, you know somewhere in the next five years we're going to have to raise revenue again because they have not demonstrated. They know how to get spending under control. They've just continued to run these deficits all the time, arguing that we can do it better. Right. Well, and so you, again, talk about the flat tax as you have. I mean, there's three different ways that this basically controls costs. Let's go over those three ways quickly. Here We're down to the last four minutes. Well, the first way is it spreads the burden evenly across all Alaskans. No Alaskans get a free ride under the PFD cut. The top 20% essentially gets a free ride under a regressive income tax. The bottom 20, 20%, bottom 40% actually get a free ride. What a flat tax does is spread it across all Alaskans. They all have buy-in. So if you have increased government spending, if you don't get spending under control, every Alaskan's paying more. That engages every Alaskan in the effort to try to, to, try to control spending. The second thing about a flat tax is it's hugely transparent. Under PFD cuts, under income taxes, you don't really you don't really understand the tie between uh, uh, government spending and what you're paying in new re- and, and what what you're suffering in terms of, of income loss. Under a flat tax, you know exactly what the cost of increased government spending translates into. So, if if you run a certain deficit and that produces a two percent flat tax, if you run a higher deficit, that produces a three percent flat tax. And you know immediately, Alaskans will know immediately that an increase in government spending uh, uh, beyond what our long-term sustainable revenue level is, an increase in government spending is going to cost them, all of them, all of us, another half a percent or another percent. And and so Alaskans can say to – it's immediately transparent. You can immediately translate that into the percentage that all Alaskans are are going to suffer. And so all Alaskans can say, look. I'm willing to chip in 2% of, of, my, of my income to fund government. That's, a, that's, that's fair. I'm willing to do that. I'm not willing to go to 3%. And that immediately translates across the board. That immediately translates into a revenue limitation that the, that the legislature then needs to observe. So it affects all Alaskans equally. Uh, it affects and, and, and it's translatable into, into an easy number that Alaskans immediately can latch on to. And say we're not going to go past that, go past this level, uh, and uh, and and tell their legislators to stop at that level. 
So what do we need to do? And I, and I wish we could talk about cuts because I did get a message from Harold talking about formula foundations and other things that we should be looking at. But nobody seems to have an interest in that right now on either one of the majorities, the House or the Senate, talking about any kind of further cuts. So this is why we're making this argument right now. Yep, absolutely right. And and what has to, what has to happen is every time – uh, somebody brings up new revenues, either in this coming special session or in the coming regular session, saying we need to make these PFD cuts permanent or we need to do that. The response needs to be no. Flat We tax. need to look at a flat tax instead because that's fair. Brad keithley has been our guest. We're out of time. Brad, thanks so much for coming on the program. We appreciate it. The Michael Duke Show. Could-